Hey, I hear you want to evaluate some coffee with us, some roasts. All right. So we have a big evaluation day. So the way I've been trained is you kind of always want to start out, start the day with the lightest roasts. And then as the day progresses, you kind of work your way into the darker roasts. Now that's also kind of ambiguous because what am I talking about? Am I talking about sourcing cuppings, production cuppings, other maybe on a toll roasting account or something like that? Yeah, it's, it's really, you know, I'm not even really talking about cupping so much. I'm talking about just, well, we're gonna call them tastings, evaluations. But we're gonna walk through all those kind of processes or a fair, fair few of those. We're gonna start with lights and work our way to darks. So that being said, the lightest light that I would cup would be a sample roast. So that's what we're gonna start with today. So we're first gonna do a sample roast cupping, and then later we're gonna do a production roast cupping. So some of you right now might be like saying to yourself, hey, what's the difference? Not a huge difference, but there's a lot difference. So basically a sample roast cupping would be something that I have set up right here. So you can see I have five cup sets. I've already ground my coffee, which hopefully this video is not gonna take more than five minutes or then we're gonna, we're gonna push me on protocol. But I have five cup sets. The coffee's already been pre-ground, pre-weighed. It's all according to a very specific protocol. And I also have this. This is a cupping sheet. It's actually to evaluate a sample roast on the cupping table. So we have a cupping table, which any table can be a cupping table. We have the cupping form. We have all of our cupping tools and we have sample roasts. So earlier you might've seen a video where I did sample versus sample, talking a little bit about sample roasting. Sample roasting is a very specific thing, mostly done by importers and exporters to evaluate the quality of green coffee. Some big roasteries, they have a huge QC department or R&D department and part of their lab actually would do sample roasting. So they would really have a deep understanding of greens. But then they also might be doing a lot of direct trading and so they're kind of working as their own importer. So there is roasteries that do a lot of sample roasting. Not a lot of smaller roasteries do the sample roasting because they don't have the equipment or the bandwidth within a company to do all this protocol. So that's why we're kind of walking through this. So I can show, this is what sample roasting is. Not super applicable for a lot of you. Later on, we'll do production. We're gonna evaluate that in a different way. That might be very applicable to you all. But the process though is super important. This process is important to the final production roast cupping. For me, this is part of my process. I sample roast all coffees, and then that gives me the qualities that that green coffee has to then build a production roast. Or vice versa, if I'm production roasting a coffee that I'm not really super familiar with, I might go back and sample roast it so I can have a better, clear understanding of actually what I'm working with and why I'm failing in certain, certain avenues or capacities as a production roaster. So it's a lot of words, it's a lot of talk. Basically, we're just gonna get into the protocol right now. I'm gonna do a sample roast cupping right now. Okay, well I have my ground sample ready. So basically now is the time where I wanna smell my dry grounds and then add water and then start going through the sample roast cupping. So I'm gonna start my cupping right now. So stick along and enjoy the, enjoy the process. the sample roast cupping. Why would we do this cupping? Why would we do a sample roast cupping? So we did two different sample roast cuppings that you just saw. The first sample roast cupping was a set of four coffees and it was actually four different washed Ethiopians that were looking at sourcing. So one of the traditional ways you use a sample roast cupping is to source, source coffees. We know a certain flavor profile for the washed Ethiopians that we like to source. So we then order samples from our importer to get delivered. We then go through the pro protocol of green grading those samples, getting this, the green grade evaluation. Then we sample roast. Then we let those coffees rest for anywhere between 12 and 24 hours is the protocol. Then we cup them according to SCA protocol. And then we evaluate the cup based on what we're looking for for this coffee. So with these four washed Ethios, we were looking to find the best of the four to match up with what we and our customers are looking for. So that's what we did and we made a decision. And this time I actually brought in some of the other members of the cupping team here in Rose City to help me with this purchase decision because I was actually struggling a little bit with this washed Ethio because I had some conflicting, conflicting results. 
So we did a third cupping and we finally came to a decision. So that's probably the first and primary way you would use a sample rose cupping. So a second way, which is what we also did with the second cupping, is maybe you have some coffees around that you've been using in certain ways, but you've never sample roasted them to really learn about their qualities. Or maybe you have a coffee that you've been roasting for a while and now it's starting to get old and you're not really sure how that coffee's hanging out anymore, what the coffee has for quality, what the best use is for that coffee. So you can almost restart the process with that coffee by bringing it back to the sample roaster or whatever sample roasting system you have, re-roasting it and then re-cupping it as a sample roast to figure out, hey, this is where this coffee that I've had for six months and it used to be so bright and clean and juicy and now it's actually showing a little bit of age. That information I'm gonna use to rework my production roast profile. So that's one thing, or you're just looking to learn more about coffee. You just want to explore coffees in a little bit greater sense. So production roasters tend to do variant production roasts to explore coffees in that in different production roast levels. Well, another thing, if you're a production roaster and you're not used to drinking sample roasts or light, really light coffees, try exploring really light roast in that same context, which that would be kind of the context of a sample roast. So you take, you take coffees that you're not sure of what qualities they have as a green, and you do really light roast on them, and then you evaluate them just purely on qualities of cup, not qualities of roast. So that's basically what we're doing with this process. So anything like that might make sense to you all, and it might be an important piece for you all, but that's really just for this process. So the second process of this would be to keep going and taking it into production. We're gonna take all this data, and then we're gonna utilize that for the next step, which is the production roast profile cupping, or tasting, I wanna say. So that is where you're evaluating quality of roast. This process was all about quality of green. The other process is all about quality of roast. So those are the big distinctions. So what we just did is super helpful when you're looking at quality of green or looking at the qualities that are in the green. Now, if you're looking at production roasts and how actual roast craft is impacting green, things like that, then the other side of this coin is what will be better for you, which we're gonna do in the next section but we've run out of time today, so we're, ending, we're gonna end up having to move the production roast cupping. Now, if this is a sample roast cupping, we wouldn't be able to do that because those coffees can only rest 12 to 24 hours. But since this is a production roast cupping, we're gonna give those coffees an extra two and a half days of rest over the weekend and then recup them on Monday, which actually would probably be better results and more, more clear results for what a customer that's drinking a production roast would probably get because they're probably gonna get those coffees five to seven days off roast. We're gonna do the production roast cupping, and then I'll also do an intro and an outro just to let you guys know why we do this and what we kind of are doing it for. Okay, well, I hope it was entertaining. I hope you guys got to learn a little bit. Cheers. Hello, everybody. So welcome back. We're gonna actually follow through with the production roast cupping that we talked about. In the previous week, we had done a little bit of sample roasting, sample versus sample, to explain a little of that process too. So now we're kind of going all the way forward with the actual sensory evaluation. Now we're going into the production roast side of, of tasting, I should say. Now, I just wanna be really clear that I, when I was first trained as a coffee professional, I did green grade cuppings. So cuppings basically, which are, it's, it's a brewing system that's based basically for the evaluation, mostly for importers and for the evaluation of green. But a lot of roasters, a lot of coffee professionals still use cupping to basically, uh, as the sensory evaluation protocol or technique, for roasted product, production roasted product. That's kind of a, an industry standard, even though it's not really meant to be. So there is some problems with using that. I'm gonna explain that in a little bit, but just so you guys know, I still follow the cupping procedure and I still even use the cupping form. I just hybridize both. And we'll talk through that a little bit as we go forward. But for you all at home, you don't have to cup. The important part is that you taste your coffee. You just have to taste your roasts and you do it as uniform and basically removing as many potential variables as you can. Even time is a variable. So if you only have one French press, it's gonna be really hard with one French press because you're gonna to have to do one, pour it off, taste it, wait 20 minutes or whatever, do another. It's gonna be hard to evaluate those roasts against each other in that kind of context. So if you're doing a tasting, just try and taste things at the same time. That's, that's one of the reasons why cuppings are still used, I think, a lot in production roast tastings because you can do a lot of different coffees at the same time with minimal equipment. You can see right here, I'm using less cups and stuff than I did for, for a sample roast cupping to do a production roast cupping. So why would you, why are we doing sensory evaluation? What's the purpose of doing what I'm doing? 
So there's multiple things going on in this table right now, and I'm just gonna talk through that right now. So over here, we have three different production roasts that have been roasted in the past. And I'm basically I'm gonna quality control these coffees after age of roast. I've already done the R&D on the roast and the coffee. I've done the production roasting. Now this coffee has been, it's been hanging out for a bit. And I'm gonna quality control the aging of these roasts. So that's this side of the table. Now over here on this side of the table, I actually have the new natural Colombian. And I'm actually working on that coffee just to kind of develop it out in multiple roast uh, profiles just to see what kind of qualities it has as a drinkable production roast. So I have three different ones over here that I'm fiddling with and I'm just trying to follow through with that new coffee just to learn as much of, as I can. Um, I do also have another kind of odd experiment going on over here in production roasting world and this is a new machine that we've added to the roastery and added to the city's lineup and so we're, I'm, I'm running through that machine with one coffee a wash Colombian just to try and figure out how that machine makes the cups taste differently. What variance there is in that machine from the previous machines in cup. So this is a cup experiment on a new roasting machine. And then over here I have kind of two things going on. I have two production roasts of a new coffee for this unique thing we did on Friday. And then I also have the same coffee, an ongoing production roast development uh, process I'm doing in that coffee, trying to get it ready for final consumption of a production roast. And so I just do those on the same side of the table because they're all three production roasts. They're all in the same kind of range of roast and it's the same green coffee. So I'm doing all of that at the same time on this production roast cupping table. And you can be doing anything in that context as a production roast cupping or a production roast tasting. So just to keep following through, I'm gonna keep using my cupping form. I'm using this form because it's already out there. I don't have to do any more work to make it. I just, I just fill it out in a different way. So the first thing I do is at the top, I write production roast. So that I know that I'm doing a production roast cupping. I only use seven to nine as a score. Eight for me is an acceptable cup flavor in that quality for a production roast. That's my standard. So if it tastes the way it should, it's an eight. If it's better than it, than it should taste, it's an 8 to 5. If it's really better, it's an 8 to 5. Things of that sort. Now, if the cup, the quality of that cup tastes below what it should taste as a production roast, then it scores below 8. 7 7 5 would be, oh my gosh, the acidity in this Ethio is a little bit off. It should be an 8. That's where I like it. Or that's the way it should be. I'm tasting it's thinner. Maybe it's a little sour. I'm going to score it 7 7 5. Any quality of a production roast that's below 8 needs attention in the roasting. So that's how I do my production roast scoring. Eight is acceptable, above eight is great. Hey, why did we do this? Let's go back and figure it out. Maybe we're gonna make this our new ideal. Below eight, we need to work on this. It's not tasting as good as it should. And that's it. I only work from seven to nine. And I fill the boxes just the same, you know what I mean? But I don't use all the boxes because some of the boxes don't matter. So the boxes I specifically focus on are fragrance, aroma, flavor, aftertaste, acidity, body, balance, sweetness, and overall. And I score those just like that. Even though the sweetness box is five boxes, and it's kind of more of a uniformity score, I'm not using it that way. I'm using it just the way I said. Somewhere between seven and nine with eight being acceptable sweetness. So if you want to make your own form, those are the parameters I've used, those eight parameters. Now another way you can score, now this is just the way that I score because it's something that I've taught myself in no way is this the only way or the right way. This is just the way that's the easiest for me to acquire the most knowledge and data. Or you can go to a simple notepad. I see a lot of roasters or a lot of cuppers or a lot of tasters just using a really simple notepad. You can write out your little boxes, fragrance, aroma, and make your own little pages like that every time. Or you can do something as simple as one section for smell and one section for taste. Then you go through and grade dry smell, then you go through and grade wet smell, then you go through and grade all the different uh, avenues of taste. And that's, that, that's at a baseline probably all you really need to do as a roaster to start to track your roasts and to develop your own palate and start to see how your roasting is interacting with the cup. So that's a really simple way. So you can also see that I've modified my protocol from the sample roast protocol. Sample roast protocol is five cups because you're working on uniformity, consistency of green, things like that. For this, we're not. We're looking at the production roast. So if there's a lack of uniformity in green, that's not our fault. This is kind of a situation where now we're the roaster and we're trying to roast this green as best as we can. So we don't want the green quality 
to basically um, have input into the way we evaluate the different roasts. You know, let's say we're looking at these three roasts. Let's say this one had like some green defect in it. We need to be able to identify that and not throw this roast under the bus because there's some green defect in it. So that's one thing that's a little bit different. So I've removed a bunch of the cups. I no longer need five cups because we're not looking for uniformity. I bring it down to two cups. And you can do it as little as one cup because really all we're looking for is how does this roast taste? So I just use two cups, but I still use the same protocol, the same cupping protocol because that's, that's what's easiest for me. So I'm gonna go through and cup these coffees just, just as the standard protocol with less cups and then evaluate those in that format that I just explained to you as a production roast format. So I'm gonna help you all with a little bit more knowledge around production roast tasting or just tasting in general. All right, I'll see you in a little bit. sensory experience or the flavor experience in the sample roast cupping is going to be very kind of a tight window. You know, it's going to be a lot of the fruit and vegetable kind of flavors, you know what I mean? But then as you move on to a production roast cupping, it kind of opens up the door for all the flavors to be on the table. So on a really light, light roast or underdeveloped light roast, you're going to have a lot of vegetable and fruit, you know, and then on a, like a extreme, you know, overdeveloped dark roast, you're going to have a lot of leather and herb and caramelization and things like that, maybe even roast. You know what I mean? So I had a little bit of all that kind of on the table today. So it's kind of a fun uh, table. Um, over here, I found it really exciting. This is probably my favorite set and my worst favorite set for different reasons. So this is a coffee that I've, that this is a machine test, but the coffee cupped out awesome and the roast is awesome. And I'm really yet to, I haven't spent a lot of time with this coffee. So I don't really, I know the coffee, but I don't really know how it tastes as a really nice production roast. And that to me tastes like a really nice production roast of that coffee. So I was really excited to have that cup, more for the coffee than for the machine, but Steve will be uh, really happy to hear that, uh, the good news on the machine side. But if you also notice, I pushed the cup off to the side when I cupped that one. So that was what I was talking about earlier, is you don't want a green defect to affect or to impact your production roast. So as soon as I tasted that cup, I knew there was a severe green defect in that cup. And so as a cupper, I pushed that cup away to signify that it's not to be tasted. So that doesn't get involved in my process at all here, other than not tasting it. Um, I wish you all were here, because I think it's the single strongest phenolic cup I've ever tasted. So when we talk about phenolic, we talk about medicinal, band-aid, and inky. I rarely had one that was super inky. This is inky. That defect is a stronger tasting defect, but this is a very strong cup of it. And once you taste it once, you can never untaste it. So you, it's kind of forever locked in your brain. So I wish you guys were all here to try that, or I could somehow send smell vision through the screen, but that's life. Okay, and then over here, with these Columbia Naturals, they're all great, but it's really hard to pick a favorite because this coffee seems to shine in any roast. But I've yet to have a, a roast, even one that I don't really pay much attention to, of this coffee not taste pretty awesome in some weird way. Which one I'm gonna choose to stick with, or you wanna choose to stick with, that's up to you all, and that's the fun about being a coffee roaster. I like to make at least three passes. Um, I like to make a final pass too to, to do my overall. That's kind of what I like. Temperature, I like to do different temperatures. You know, between 10 and 14 minutes and I'll start my first pass. And then five or six minutes later, I'll do a second. And then I'll tend to do a third and I'll probably do another pass. So I, so I think we're at 30 minutes right now. So I like to make another pass when it's cool, especially with production roasts. Sample roasts, not so much because they're not being roasted for development. But production roasts, yes. A, a well roasted coffee should taste good hot, cool, and cold. You know what I mean? So it's not a bad idea to leave your production roast on the table a little longer and maybe make one last visit before you pour them out to be, evaluate that production roast. 
And if you're tasting some off flavors in that cool cup, then something could be a little wacky with your green or with your roast. So thanks for sticking on, and I hope this is educational and helpful. It's fun. All right, have a good night.